in trying to understand this Church of Scientology, it's best to start at the beginning. Now, the beginning, according to the Scientologists, is what I've just read to you. But as I said before, what if the beginning were different? What if all of that was a lie? Well, not all of it, but a good chunk of it. L. Ron Hubbard did serve in the military, but there were several things he did during his service that were questionable. He was discharged, uh, not dishonorably from what I've read, but there were several things that he did that were questionable. But where things start getting really shady is when Scientology comes into the picture. In March 1952, Hubbard moved to Phoenix, Arizona. He claimed that he had conducted years of intensive research into the nature of human existence. He codified a set of ideas that promised to improve the condition of the human spirit, which he called a thetan. To describe his findings, he developed an elaborate system of neo-goals and... Eh, neologisms which he described as Scientology and applied religious philosophy. In December 1953, Hubbard founded the Church of Scientology in Camden, New Jersey. He moved to Washington, D.C. in 1955 and organized the founding Church of Scientology. In other words, Hubbard did indeed found Scientology, unlike what the Scientologists' false history claims. His Washington, D.C. residence, the L. Ron Hubbard House, now operates as a historic house museum. In 1952, Hubbard visit, visited England for the first time and started a Dianetic training center in London. The news spread far and wide abroad. In 1959, Hubbard moved to England where he supervised a growing organization from St. Hill Manor near the Sussex town of East Grinston, a Georgian manor house once owned by the Maharaja of Jaipur which Hubbard purchased in 1959. This became the world headquarters of Scientology. Now, you notice here, this is all during the 1950s period and 1960s period, and if you go back to the history that I read earlier, that period is mysteriously blank. Hubbard's followers believed his techniques gave them access to their past lives, the traumas of which led to failures in the present unless they were dealt with in a process referred to as auditing. By this time, the 1950s, just after the publication of Dianetics, the modern science of mental health, Hubbard had introduced a biofeedback device to the auditing process, which he called a Hubbard Electropsychometer, or E-meter. Originally invented in the 1940s by a chiropractor and later Dianetics enthusiast named Volney Matheson and refined to Hubbard's specifications in 1959. This machine is used by Scientologists in auditing to evaluate what Hubbard referred to as mental masses, which were said to impede thetans from realizing their full potential. Hubbard professed that many physical diseases were psychosomatic, and that the person who had attained an enlightened state of clear would be relatively disease-free. Hubbard insisted humanity was imperiled by such forces which were the result of negative memories or engrams stored in the unconscious or reactive mind, some carried by the immortal thetans for billions of years. Church members were expected to pay fixed donation rates for courses, auditing, books, and e-meters, all of which proved very lucrative for the church, which paid emulents directly to Hubbard and his family. Directly to Hubbard and his family. In a case fought by the founding Church of Scientology in Washington, D.C. over its tax-exempt status, revoked in 1958 because of those emoluments, it was found that Hubbard had personally received over 108 thousand dollars from the church and affiliates over a four-year period, over and above the percentage of gross income, usually around 10 percent. He received the church-affiliated organizations. Hubbard denied such emulents many times in writing, stating that instead that he had never received any money from the church. The Church of Scientology founded its own companies to publish Hubbard's works, Bridge Publications for the U.S. and Canadian market, and New Era Publications based in Denmark for the rest of the world. New volumes of his transcribed lectures continue to be produced. There are estimated to be 110 related volumes. Hubbard also wrote that a number of works of fiction during the 1930s and 1980s, which are published by Scientology-owned Galaxy Press. All three of these publishing companies are subordinate to Author Services, Inc., 
another Scientology corporation. Some documents written by Hubbard himself suggest he regarded Scientology as a business, not a religion. In one letter dated April 10th, 1953, he says that calling Scientology a religion solves a problem of practical business. A religion charter could be necessary in Pennsylvania or New Jersey to make it stick. In 1962 policy letter, he said that Scientology is being planned on a religious organization basis throughout the world. This will not upset in any way the usual activities of any organization. It is entirely a matter for accountants and solicitors. However, in his work, Hubbard emphasizes the importance of spirit and mind over the physical body. He says, the body can be studied in such books as Gray's Anatomy and other anatomical tests. This is the province of the medical doctor and usually the old-time psychiatrists or psychologists who were involved in the, bo in the main and body worship. Scientology became a focus of controversy across the English-speaking world during the mid-1960s with the United Kingdom, New Zealand, South Africa, and Australian state of Victoria and the Canadian province of Ontario all holding public inquiries into Scientology's activities. In 1966, Hubbard moved to Rhodesia, claiming to be the reincarnation of De Beer founder Cecil Rhodes. Following Ian Smith's unilateral declaration of independence, Hubbard offered to invest large sums in Rhodesia's economy, which was then hit by UN sanctions, but was asked to leave the country. Around 1967, Hubbard formed a religious order known as the Sea Organization, or Sea Org. We'll get into that later. With titles and uniforms, the Sea Org subsequently became a management group within Hubbard's Scientology empire. He was attended by Commodore's messengers, teenage girls who performed various tasks for him. Hmm, such as fixing his shower, dressing him, and catching the ash from his cigarettes. He had, he had frequent screaming tantrums and, ins and instituted harsh punishments such as being confined to the ship's dirty chain locker for days or weeks at a time, or being bound, blindfolded, and thrown overboard. Some of these punishments were applied to children as well as adults. A letter Hubbard wrote to his third wife, Mary Sue, when he was in Las Palmas around 1967. I'm drinking lots of rum and popping pinks and grays. An unauthorized Hubbard biography also says that John McMasters told me that on the flagship Apollo in the late 60s he witnessed Hubbard's drug supply. It was the largest drug chest I had ever seen. He had everything. This was confirmed by Gary Armstrong through Virginia Downsboro, who said in 1967 Hubbard returned to Las Palmas totally debilitated from drugs. His drug use appeared to predate the 1967 accounts. Hubbard claimed in a letter to his first wife that he had once been an opium addict. The last sentence of the letter reads, I do love you, even if I used to be an opium addict. <coughs> Excuse me. In March 1969, the Greek government branded L. Ron Hubbard and his group of 200 disciples undesirables. The group had been living aboard the 3,300-ton Panamanian ship Apollo and had been docked in the harbor of Corfu Island since August. 